Storygram Network. Hi, I'm Jeff Davis. As we venture out on the wine road, I'll feature a winery in the midst of a major celebration and a tasting room in downtown Napa that's offering a rare and surprisingly satisfying wine pairing. Let's go. The fruit flavors in Zin, for us, we just don't see those same flavor combinations in other grapes. You know, the unique spiciness and, and brambly fruit flavors, it makes it really special for us. When we wanted to create something a little bit different, and I was trying to find something that had very interesting and unique flavors, and we call it the salt and acid pairing, largely because my style of wine is to be very acid-driven. Oh, okay. Coming up later in the podcast, winemaker Justin Prizer will explain his salt and acid pairing. Now, this may not sound appetizing, but remember, when pairing wine with food, the acid plays well with salty elements. This pairing is likely one you haven't come across yet, and the um, gourmet food he's pairing his aged wine with is a rarity and remarkably enjoyable. I'll get into more detail prior to the interview. First up is winemaker Andy Robinson of Sonoma County's Segazio Family Vineyards. If you're from the area or have visited, you may know they focus on Zinfandel and have for quite some time, as you'll hear. You can find their brand in grocery, liquor stores, and restaurants as well. We recorded this interview just days before National Zinfandel Day. That was one reason Andy and I hooked up. The other was to highlight Segazio's 125th anniversary. That's quite a legacy. While Andy is not a family member, he's had steady access to those who have grown up within the family's long history. Naturally, I started off by congratulating him on their 125th year. Thank you. Thank you very much. You've been here about, what, 100 of those? It <laughs> feels like it sometimes, but no, it's about, it's been about 17 years now for me. Yeah, that's fantastic. And um, I saw that you grew up in the Finger Lakes region, up in New York, near there, and uh what inspired you to come to Sonoma County and not stay up in that burgeoning wine region? You know, um, it, was a, it was a tough decision at the time. The way I looked at it was Napa and Sonoma was a place where um, I could come out and, you know, hopefully take a temporary, like a harvest job and, um, and learn some things. And initially that was the plan was learn you know learn winemaking and then uh go back to the finger lakes and ply my trade there and i'll tell you once i came out here and <laughs> one thing is just the the climate but also the people really make you want to stay and then you also realize that the things you learn in one place with winemaking don't always apply everywhere else and usually sure. they don't so very different world and uh I decided to make it my home when you were pursuing your chemical engineering degree, did you anticipate having a winemaking vocation, or were you still kind of testing the waters on other job possibilities? Absolutely. Um, I think that was, for me, chemistry was something that I, I really loved doing and I was really good at, and I never knew what I was going to do with it. Um, and as I went through university and and got into chem engineering, I, um, I realized that hey, this is pretty applicable in uh, brewing beer. It's like, wow. Yeah. Every, it's not just chemical plants where all this knowledge is used. And um, and I didn't know that winemaking was something that you could turn into a viable job. Um, I thought of it always as, like, someday I'm going to do this as a, as a hobby. All right. um, and once I realized that the industry was really, you know, burgeoning and that, that it was really viable in California especially, um, it just, all the pieces came together. Right. Yeah. Well, you had a great opportunity when you did get into the business, uh, being able to work with Charles Krug yeah. when you arrived in NorCal. And, yeah. and boy, that's Napa's oldest winery. And yeah. and now for the last 17 years, you've been at one of Sonoma's oldest wineries uh, yeah. here at Sagacia. Yeah, it's funny how that worked out in that, um, like you said, Charles Krug, one of Napa's oldest wineries, if not the oldest. I think it's the oldest, the oldest, in, oldest in Napa Valley. In Napa yeah. Valley. Um, to go from one you know one italian winemaking family to another was i i can't really say it was just serendipitous it was uh yeah really a stroke of luck and and then being able to just make the most of the opportunity and learn as much as you can from the people you work with mm, right and some uh, talented winemakers over there that you were working with absolutely um worked with uh, jack cole 
uh, when he was making the wines at Charles Krug and uh, John Monnier who made the uh, the CK Mondavi wines mm-hmm. and a lot of those things you learn in your first couple years you remember forever especially working in the cellar when it's such a job that you just need to learn hands on uh huh and many of your 17 years here you were alongside uh, head winemaker Ted Segacio yes yeah up until uh, just about 2 years ago really a, a great person to learn from mm-hmm. and I thought about this a little bit, you know, leading into this interview and in that, and, and I think maybe some of the best teachers don't realize they're teaching and then, oh, right. and then maybe some of the best students don't really realize you're, you're learning. You're just, you're just doing it mm-hmm. and you're learning how to do it. That's the best way to, to go through that, isn't it's it? It's great. Aside from his time with Ted, he also has the chance to work with other Segacio family lineage, like the viticulture director, Ned Newmiller, who is the great-great-grandson of the founder, Eduardo Segacio. What incredible knowledge you've had access to working side-by-side with both of those who played a, a major role in the family legacy. Absolutely. And Ned, Ned and I now, uh, we just are looking forward to what, what we'll be able to do in the future. Um, his dad... Jim has had uh, managed the vineyards for the last 35 years, and uh, and Ned grew up at, at one of our ranches um, out in Dry Creek. So, you know, he remembers running those vines, running those rows through the early, you know, his early years, and you know, to be able to walk them now side by side and decide when we're picking and and what to do with cover crops and and thinning fruit and. And have all these things really start to make sense in a firsthand uh, fashion is, is really great. Yeah. I love that quote I saw from Ned. At Segacio Family Vineyards, we've been kicking the same dirt and tending the same vine for 125 years. Yeah. And that's no exaggeration. <laughs> Not at all. One of the wines we have in front of us here is the Home Ranch mm-hmm. Zin, and um, that's where it all started for us. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and thank you for sharing your wines, sure. by the way. And we're drinking the uh, Sonoma brand right now, which is the one that's in greater release, I guess, uh, in retail. And boy, it's for a grocery store type of wine. Such good flavor in that in that wine. Yeah, I, I think there's a there's a pride that we share in being able to make a great product and then also have it available to people, and mm-hmm. and they know wh- where they can find it, and uh, and they know that it's going to be consistent year in and year out. Yeah. We are, again, talking today in celebration of Segacio family's 125th anniversary. And the Segacios, along with a number of Italian families, have made Zinfandel the mainstay here in Sonoma County. How do you like working with that grape? It can be a little challenging sometimes. I think sometimes sometimes the winemaker chooses the grape, and and in this case, the grape chose the winemaker. Because, you know, I would say I kind of stumbled into it, but there's a fascination that starts pretty quickly, and you realize that, of all of all grapes to work with, Zinfandel is is a it's a labor of love, but it's also it's not easy. There's the challenges start right at bud break, and bloom, and you know you're really given a lot of choices and working towards you know to be able to end up with a wine that's that has purity and focused fruit flavors. Um, it all starts with trying to narrow that ripening window, and I think at every stage, you know the winemaking encourage us to encourages us to make decisions and uh and then you can you know taste the fruits of your labor which is great but the fruit flavors in zin just really something that for us we just don't see those same flavor combinations in other in other grapes and it makes it really special for us are you talking about the spices yeah and the depth of character absolutely it's just this more of a you know, the, just a unique spiciness and, and brambly fruit flavors that um, that I think really set it apart, that, that raspberry and, and yeah. um, blackberry component. People might be able to tell that as we're talking, we're opening we're, bottles yep, and pouring. Yep. And <laughs> so we're on to the Cortina now. Give me a little background on the Cortina. Yeah, so the Cortina Zinfandel is grown out in Dry Creek Valley. Um, the core of this blend, about 60% of it, is grown at a vineyard we call Chen's Vineyard. And that's actually owned by Ted and his brothers and sisters and his father, uh, Ed Segazio. Mm-hmm. So Ed Segazio would be, the, he would be third generation Segazio. And he was the winemaker um, from the late 40s up until 
uh, Ted took over in the late 70s. Yeah, boy. So, you know, they, they grew up, uh, you know, they bought that ranch in the 50s, and, uh, and, and Ted and his dad and a couple others planted the, the, the oldest vines there in the early 70s. And he'll tell me stories about that one where that was field grafted. And back then, if you were really brave and you're, you were uh, confident that you were good at it, you put your initials at the end of the row that you grafted. <laughs> and if you if you weren't very confident, you didn't put your initials there because you know that every generation walking by that row forever is going to know who did this row and how many they got and how many they missed when they grafted it. So <laughs> it was pretty cool. Imagine seeing those old initials on vineyard posts. He didn't say how far back that tradition went, but I'm sure it's been going on for quite a while. There's some history for you. He's Andy Robinson of Segazio Family Vineyards. He brought out three Zins for us to enjoy while we chatted, and I was just noticing the Cortina Zin had a slightly lighter mouthfeel and flavor of cranberry that I didn't get in the Sonoma Zin. Yeah, so one thing that sets this one apart is that this is uh, 100% Zinfandel. So with the Sonoma Zinfandel, with the last wine we had, and also with the Home Ranch, uh, we used some other grapes in that blend, so about... You know, any any given year it could be seven to ten percent petite Syrah, right? And that kind of adds some dark fruit, some concentration, um, which I really enjoy. And some structure yeah. to the the finish. But this the Cortina is a hundred percent Zin, and so we're really showcasing just that purity and mm-hmm. elegance of Zinfandel grown in that. Um, actually, it's a soil type. The Cortina is named after a soil type that's prevalent throughout the Dry Creek Valley. Mm-hmm. It's this fine gravelly loam that contributes to the the weight and the texture of this wine. Yeah, yeah, it's a good example of the the variety and gives people a, a good sense of what a pure Zinfandel tastes like, mm-hmm. at least from Dry Creek Valley. You mentioned uh, Home Ranch and and these few here, but uh, you also get to work with some other grapes from uh, iconic vineyards, mm-hmm. uh, historic Zinfandel vineyards in the area. Yeah. Um, we work with the Pagani family That's in, in Sonoma Valley. That one just stands out. Um, we have made Monterosso over the years. Oh, that's another fantastic. Um, which is another just legendary vineyard. Uh, we still make Pagani, and working with that ranch is it's like taking a, a step back in time when you're walking those vineyards. Um, so I think they were planted in the 1880s, some of them, mm-hmm. some of the blocks. And uh, it just it's pretty special to be able to... You know, because that, especially Pagani, there's quite a few Zim producers that make wine from there. Mm -hmm. And I'd say more so than any other vineyard, um, we all kind of interpret it a little bit differently. And it makes it really fun to to taste those wines side by side. And, and you know, they came from the same vintage, from the same place, and uh, and see how we each interpret those. It's it's pretty cool. I I know of one or two uh, Napa. Zinfandel mm-hmm. producers who source from there. Absolutely, yeah. yeah. Yeah, quite a few. I would say the top names that, you know, that that are in the industry, some of them. And you also have some old vine Sangiovese you get to work with. We do. With. Yeah, we do. We uh So our oldest block, we call affectionately Chianti Station because it was located right next to the original Chianti Station railroad stop, which was at our home ranch. Uh up until I guess the the late '60s, it mm-hmm. was operating as a as a train stop, and uh, we still actually have the building, the original train station building uh, at the home ranch. That's great. Um, and that original block's about an acre and a half, and it's still existing, uh, still growing, uh, you know, still producing grapes. But I think the cool one of the coolest things that that really uh, enamored me with the with our Italian wine program here was, and it was right around the time that I started with the winery was the the story of the venom and right. how we planted more of our Sangiovese. So, really taking cuttings from that original block, which is a a field blend, a mixture of clones and some some different grapes. Um, the Segazios selected their favorite vines, propagated the budwood from those. And then planted those in the surrounding blocks. Um, and after four different propagations, essentially, trying to narrow that, that field selection, 
we came up with the blocks that we planted on Rattlesnake Hill. So just behind the old Victorian house okay. on the uh, the west side of the freeway, there's the steep terraced hillside um, of where we grow uh, where we grow our we feel is our best Sangiovese, and that goes into the Venom blend. Tell me again, what's in the Venom? So that's a that's a pure Sangiovese. Okay, um, all right. And we have two clones that we that we that we focused on. One which is called M and J, so Mutt and Jeff, so big berries <laughs> and small berries. So you get some you get some fruit. But you also get some concentration from those small berries, and then, um, and then another one which we've affectionately called RSB stands for real small berry. So the smallest berry Sangiovese clone that we could isolate from our vineyard, we find just gives us that intensity and the structure that, yeah. that we like to make into that wine. I like the packaging too on the the venom. Yeah, the absolutely. bottle's so much different it's, than everything else you do here. It is. It really stands out. Yeah. <laughs> nice. And the other thing I've always liked about Sagacio is uh, the choice of other Italian varietals like Alianico and Barbera, Arnais, and Vermentino. Mm-hmm. So you have those under your portfolio as well. We do. Yeah, we uh, let's see. The, the Alianico was planted in, um, I want to say, 98. So I think our first, I think our first vintage was uh, 2002 of that wine. Ahead of our time, I feel like we're still a little bit ahead of our time with that planting, and I hope the vineyard yeah. survives until until it comes into its own, because that's a that's a variety that's just really perfect for warm weather. And whether climate change is going to lead to just global warming or whether it's just going to be climate change, is more unpredictable situations. Um, that could be, you know, I think there's there's interest in in figuring out varietals that are going to work. Um, in a in sure. a uh, different drift, different you know microclimate. So that's something that's really suited for warm weather, and it is definitely warm up at the home ranch, and and uh, and it does well. It still ripens quite late there. Um, we've also made it into a rosado the last couple of vintages. I was going to mention that, and we love it. It's it was something that I wish we had done it, you know, fifteen years ago. And and being able to show like the dichotomy of a grape, it's like, hey, this is what it can be as a rosé. But when you make it into red wine, it does this, and and they're yeah. so different, but really interesting. Sure. Yeah, how many times do you see an Alianico rosé? Not not very often if you're <laughs> if not ever. in southern Italy. Yeah, right. Exactly. Yeah, I saw that you did that. That that is so cool because I love uh, rosés that have utilized different varietals, like Syrah and. Uh, you know, even Mouvedra, and it's nice to have those choices. And it's also fun to watch people try to pronounce Alianico. Yeah. <laughs> I think sometimes it's painful a yeah. little bit. Oh, but yeah, to watch? To watch, yeah, yeah. <laughs> right. Yeah, there's a G in there that doesn't yeah, look like yeah. it, it Don't belongs. Don't pronounce it, but there is one yeah. in there. And... So you've been here 17 years. Do you see yourself staying here the, the rest of your career or hoping yeah. to maybe look at another wine region someday? You know, that's a tough question. I think the... For now, I feel like uh, there's still a lot of work to do here, and there's a lot to learn. Um, and then, you know, family um, family roots are are getting pretty deep into Healdsburg, and that uh, I have uh, now have twin six year olds who are are in the local school system, and uh, and then a four year old who's um, in nursery school so those uh-huh. and and my wife works locally in the in the school system as a nurse and so you kind of get to those those points where i would love to make wine in italy i would love to make wine somewhere else i just don't know what the timing of that's going to be it's probably going to be more sure um not retirement but but once once my work here is done which i feel like zen i don't think the work is ever done um <laughs> I was reading an article in the uh, around the founding of UC Davis with their their wine uh, department. It was like 1860s, and it talked about the Zinfandel wines from California being kind of heady and fruity and and a little bit sweet. And then I thought about this. And I'm like, well, it's been 140 years, and a lot of the Zinfandel wines in California are still kind of high alcohol and heady and fruity and a little bit sweet. Yeah. So as an industry, we have we still have a lot of work to do. 
Um, but some people enjoy that. And they do, yeah. The, the yeah. Zinfandel fruit bomb. And you know, uh, Yeah, and, and all I can say is, like, we continue to set ourselves apart as uh as you know taking trying to really take zin to the to the next level mm-hmm. and, and put it on the world stage and and uh there's always more to do well i appreciate you taking the time out of your day to sit down with me and share some wine as well congratulations on 125 years uh, here at the sagacio family winery and uh it's quite a legacy we look forward to another 125 i tell you that that's uh pretty cool spot in this industry it could happen it could it could it does it does (laughs) as we were wrapping up i was enjoying the family's flagship zin home ranch i found it had a softer mouthfeel which andy attributed to the warmer alexander valley climate it was nice to sit on the front lawn of sagacio's family tasting room and winery in healdsburg it's large enough to host tastings safely when the covid restrictions have been lifted In the meantime, find them online at segezio.com. That's S-E-G-H-E-S-I-O dot com. Now we're going to head over to downtown Napa to meet with winemaker Justin Prizer, who owns Shadowbox Cellars. They were the first tasting room to be allowed to have an outdoor tasting space, basically on the street in what they call a parklet on Coombs at First Street. As of today, they've been able to continue outdoor tastings, but call ahead to get updates on tastings and to make an appointment. In addition to having the on-street parklet, he's come up with the idea of hosting wine and gourmet potato chip tastings that actually work really well with his wine. You'll hear more about the chips coming up. They do have an indoor tasting space, which, again, during these COVID times, is unavailable at the moment. But I have to tell you, on a nice day, it was a pleasure to sit curbside. Yes, you get a little bit more of that European feel, a little excitement seeing people sit outside as opposed to just the narrow and blank pathways as you walk with the, the Napa had previously. So it's kind of exciting to see people doing something. <laughs> Not quite some time. Well, let's back up a little bit and talk about your parents. They were quite ingrained in the, the Napa and Sonoma County region with their magazine, The Prizer Key. How long ago did they start that project? So that actually began right after I finished college. Uh, I had My father had always had the idea to create a publication out here uh, that listed all the wineries and mapped them all and all the restaurants. Uh, as they had been coming out here for about 20 plus years at that point, several times a year, and really enjoyed the Napa County and the Sonoma area and everything in wine country. Uh, but always, because they were coming out often enough, were looking for some off-the-mark places. And as they would pick up other publications, they discovered that it would list a lot of the major ones that they knew about, but they were really hoping to find something that they had never been to before. And so when I finished up school and I was going to take a break and figure out what I wanted to do next, uh, my father reminded me how much I enjoyed it out here in, uh, when I came out for my 21st birthday and said, why don't you go to Napa and start working on this for us? Uh, so in 2000... He reminded you. Yes, he reminded me. In other words, he was saying, I'd really like you to go do this. I think that it was one of those where he was just kind of saying, you don't know what your, what your next step is. Uh, this could be fun for you, and we need the work done. So it would be interesting for you if you wanted to go up. Yeah, well, good. But, but we, yeah, so we created the publication, and I worked with my parents who've done the publishing and the writing. And uh, now we're this... Uh, we've been doing it for almost 15 years now, which is kind of insane when I think about that as well. <laughs> and somewhere along the way, you decided to become a winemaker. Yeah. Well, so it, it actually all began even before I moved out here. Uh, my parents had uh, a good friend named David Ramey, who I'm sure you're familiar with. Of course. Uh, and so they were having a nice meal with David in Sonoma. Uh, I believe it was in Sonoma. And they somehow they they drank a little bit and convinced David that they would like to make one barrel of Syrah for home consumption. And so that's what he did. And they loved it. And so in, that was in 2004. And then in 2005, they made two barrels. Hmm. And in 2006, it was two. Then seven, it was three. And eight, it was three. And by this time, I'm living out here. And I have a two-bedroom apartment. And the second bedroom is full of Syrah that has a label on it, but it's not legally uh, approved to sell, nor do we have a business. And so coming around the time when they're thinking about making another three barrels in 2009, I kind of just stuck my hand up and I said, hey, I think it's time to consider making this either a business or stop doing it because there's only so much you can drink and yourself and so much you can give away. So when I have 300 cases of Syrah sitting in my second bedroom and no ability to use that room, it kind of 
just dawned on us that we'd like to actually be in this business. Yeah. Oh, great. So let's jump up now to Shadow Box Sellers. Uh, who are your partners and how did you get to this point? So we, in 2009, when we began to anticipate that we wanted to be uh, part, actually producing wine that we wanted to sell, uh, my parents and I, and at this juncture, my fiance, who is now my wife, uh, and I, as well as uh, some very good friends from South Florida named Ira and Edie Holtz, all decided we wanted to create something uh, that we really enjoy because uh, we all love wine and we all liked the idea of having wine that was to our palate that we would also produce. Okay. Uh, so in 2009, we began with um, 75 cases of Cab, 75 cases of Pinot Noir, and one, and I'm sorry, and 75 cases of Syrah. Uh, and that's how everything began. Um, and it actually started with uh, an idea that we were using several winemakers. We were using one winemaker for each product. Uh, and that came from us, come, came from the magazine and doing so much work and knowing so many people that uh, over the years that we could find some small lots and find one winemaker that we really enjoyed the Chardonnay they made and one winemaker where we were enthralled with the Cabernet they made. Um, and as we kind of went through that, after a couple of years of that and the complications, not just of working with many winemakers and many uh, people and many facilities, uh, we decided that it needed to be parred down a little bit. So we started uh, working with some other winemakers, and I was always involved in the blending and in some of the processing. Um, but in 2015, we made some changes with and started working with one winemaker, and we worked with him for a few years while I was able to really put my hands into the wine a lot. And uh, then in 2017, I took over the program myself. Oh, great still with a lot of help and, and consideration from friends and other people that are much smarter than I am. So <laughs> one of the great things about Napa. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it always helps to have uh, some consultants nearby. Yes. So what inspired you to do tastings with potato chips? Now, you're not the first person I've heard to do such a thing. I'm not. Th I, so we actually, the, it's, I will admittedly say one of the, the first experience I ever had with something along this line uh, was when I was here on my 21st birthday, uh, we went to Swanson Vineyards. So this is, again, 18 years ago. So I'm um, dating a little bit. But at the same time, they would do uh, an amazing salon-style tasting that one of the first pairings they did was a potato chip topped with caviar. Yeah. Which, granted, we haven't moved into that direction quite so much. But uh, it just was an eye-opening experience to see that saltiness on both aspects of the caviar and the potato chip pairing so well with wine. Mm -hmm. um, and so when we wanted to create something a little bit different, I looked into potato chips. And I was trying to find something that had very interesting and unique flavors. And we call it the salt and acid pairing, largely because my style of wine is to be very acid-driven. Oh, okay. I love the aspect of how acid pairs with so many different and diverse food uh, components. Yeah, it cuts right through uh, heavy sauces. Fat. Yeah. It goes yeah. through fat. It goes through acid. It cuts. It's great with salt. It's great with pretty much every, and umami, great with all of those flavors. Um, and so, and I want our wines to pairing, pairingly to be quite diverse. Right. For instance, I generally take our Chardonnay, which is a very low malolactic barrel fermented Chardonnay, and I suggest it's pairing uh, as my favorite is steak tartare. So something a little bit off the map than what generally uh, somebody puts uh, a Chardonnay with. Right. Um, but uh, for the potato chips themselves, I discovered this company, and they're based here in California, at, that were making incredibly unique flavors, different cheeses. Um, and so when I, all of a sudden they sent me an email that said dry aged ribeye. And I went, wow, that is an interesting taste for a chip. I think it would be interesting to see what they're actually putting together with that. Yeah, let me back up and repeat that. Yes. <laughs> Dry-aged ribeye is one of the flavors of your potato chips. It is. well, and <laughs> Which goes good with a red wine, for sure. With red wines, it's phenomenal. Um, and it's one of those where I was very skeptical about it when I first got the email. And it said, I, and they assured me that I would be pleased with it when they sent up my samples. And so I sat down with some other friends, and some were winemakers, and uh, we all tasted through the chips and tasted through all the wines. And that first bite of the dry aged uh, wine ch of the dry aged ribeye chip from wine chips, and I was just going, "Wow, it's juicy, and I can taste the char and the grill mark on it. I really do get dry aged ribeye on this chip," and was quite fascinated by it. Wow, <laughs> I can't wait to try it. Yeah, when I was reading the information about your uh, what you're doing here. I was thinking that, yeah, potato chips go really well with sparkling wine and a white wine, I would imagine, but I never would have guessed a, a chip for red wine would work very well. 
the flavor components do need to be there, and they need to be powerful chips, obviously. Uh, the smoked Gouda is also a very diverse chip because it has just a little bit of that smokiness, but the savory of the Gouda and the richness of the cheese flavoring pairs well with both the reds and the Chardonnays at the same time. So <laughs> Yeah, great. That's wonderful. And you emphasize that the lattice cut of the potato chip helps emphasize the texture and flavor of the pairing. I believe so. Well, the lattice cut allows, A, for more of the flavoring to... There's more. There's a different surface area on all sides of the chip because you've got it interiorly as well. So it's not... With the non-lattice cut, sometimes I feel if you take a bite of it, then you're licking the flavor off of it if you don't eat the entire chip in one bite. With the lattice cut, I feel that the, the seasonings have actually gone into the uh, outside pieces and you're getting more seasoning than just potato the whole time. So <laughs> Nice. Well, yeah, I'm looking forward to trying the pairing. Uh, You poured me your 2017 Pinot of Rosé, and uh, boy, you do like acid. It's crisp, it's bright, and you mentioned that you do pick it rather early before it matures fully. Yeah, so with the the Pinot Noir is a really great example of the acid that we really that we do like to focus on. One of the reasons I like to say acid is not just the food comparing uh, the component of it, but also the ageability. Acid is really a perfect way to age your wines for longer periods of time than generally you find, which is one of the reasons why we are still pouring our 17 rosé here in the tasting room. I find it to be very bright and refreshing and full-bodied, even though it is already three years old. Yeah, it does help it age longer when there's more acid. Yes, slowly. Our 15 rosé is still on point. So it's an interesting thing to see because generally uh, a lot of rosés that are differently made are not always made to age for more than a year or two. So Right. Why don't you tell us about the rest of your wine lineup? Yeah, absolutely. Well, so I just kind of pulled some interesting stuff to taste with you today. Um, a lot of it is to show some ageability in some of the library wines that we pour. Uh, we, I, we've got some of our 2014 Chardonnay, uh, which is actually on our current, one of our current tasting menus. Uh, it's kind of interesting because this vineyard is from the Oak Knoll District here in Napa, but they were 47-year-old vines, which is kind of unheard of for Chardonnay in a lot of aspects. Yeah, those are definitely some older Chardonnay vines. Yeah, and because generally after that amount of time, you're just not getting the quality or the quantity that you want. So I'm, people are pulling them after 20 to 25 years uh, on average, I think. But I love the minerality that comes out of the age of the vines and having the, the root system be so intense and ingratiated into the soil. Um, and so what we'll do this is we'll barrel ferment it in French oak uh, and we'll age it sur But I keep the malolactic fairly low, only to about 15 to 20 percent. So that, well, we, we will end up with more of those bright acid notes and tropical flavors. Oh, yeah. Great. Great. And then the other two I have, we also make some Pinot Noir and Red Blend, but I pulled out two uh, for us for today. I just pulled out two cabs. And, of course, we're welcome to taste whatever you're, into, uh, you're interested in. Um, but uh, I pulled out our 2011 cab, which I think is tasting extremely well right now. Obviously, 2011 was one of those vintages that everybody became scared of as soon as it occurred. Right. But... I tend to think that one of those reasons was because they stayed so young and so tight for extended periods of time. Uh, And right now, this wine is developed and showing some really nice, (laughs) some really nice young notes, uh, as well as some kind of old world Bordeaux style uh, taste uh, notes at the same time. Nice. Um, And then I've also pulled out our 2015 Cabernet, uh, which is. 100% 100% Cabernet from the Yauntville district. So it's got a little, it's got some great power and some great tannins to it. And it's partially barrel fermented as well as tank fermented. So it's pulling out amazing flavors uh, out of the barrel. Uh, but what's neat of all of these wines, uh, the rose is only about a 215 case production, and the other three are all well less than 100 cases. Uh, small lot wines. We love to do small lot wines. I love the concentration I get to really, as we're going through our barrels and focusing on the blending. Um, it's kind of nice to not have to think to myself, I must make 200 cases of this. If it ends up being 75, I'm going, okay, as long as it's what the product that I really was looking for. Because that way you still get to keep it in your second bedroom, right? <laughs> yes, there we go. There is, there is quite a bit of wine in different, not just the second bedroom, but the, the closet and the garage and the under the stairs. There seems to be wine everywhere to my wife's dismay. So <laughs> I'd like to come over and visit. <laughs> and you source from the, the area's top regions, Napa, Sonoma, Paso, and the Sierra foothills. Beautiful fruit. Um, working with vineyard production managers that really focus on their fruit because we they're generally smaller vineyards. And for the most part, we're sourcing and doing single variety and single vineyard properties now with everything but our red blend. I love the concept that the vineyard speaks so 
highly for itself. Sure. Not being a viticulturist without, uh, by any means, and just having, having taken my fair share of classes, but without ever really fully working in the vines, I like working with people who are in love with their vines and in love with their vineyards so that I can fully trust what their opinions are. <laughs> right, right. Well, should we pause and do a pairing? I think that sounds great. A little salt and acid tasting? That sounds perfect. You need to try those chips. So. <laughs> okay, we'll be back after we crunch and sip. Okay, during that brief intermission, I tried the salt and acid pairing. And I have to say, I was impressed. The chip flavors are Hawaiian red sea salt, smoked gouda, and dry-aged ribeye, as we mentioned earlier. <laughs> yeah, really. Justin was kind enough to pour me his 2014 Chardonnay, 2015 Rosé of Pinot Noir, his 2017 Pinot Noir, a 2011 Cabernet Sauvignon, and a 2015 Cab. All were very enjoyable, and I really like the chips as well. As a matter of fact, I could sit and eat them without the wine. Yeah, the goal was to find something different and to have it be... I still like the aspect of it being somewhat casual, which is the other reason I chose chips as opposed to working with the, one of the rest, local restaurants and having very specific bites. Um, I like having the, the tasting be you created at the same time. So by having three different flavors of chips, um, my whole thing with wine is that it's hedonistic. It's what you like is what you like. What I like is what I like. And so I can't dictate to you what you taste and what you enjoy. So... And, and that dry-aged ribeye. Uh, what's interesting is when I was tasting it with uh, the Pinot, I did get that sense of uh, kind of a grilled steak. And when I sipped the Pinot, it did seem to bring the juices to life in my mouth. That's it's brilliant. That, that, the dry-aged ribeye, as I kind of mentioned earlier, was, is the the surprising one of the bunch you ne you can't quite imagine that it will have as much of that ribeye flavor as it really does and i'm not i need to converse with them to find out exactly what they do i'm not sure if they're just dipping it in ribeye i don't know what they're doing with frying it in the leftover fat that comes from frying a ribeye which might be an interesting concept for it um i do need to have a little more in-depth conversation so that i can maybe uh, have a better explanation for everybody <laughs> or maybe you don't want to know or maybe i don't want to know it's like the sausage you never some things you just don't want to know how they're made the uh, Hawaiian red sea salt was tasty, very flavorful chip, and the smoked gouda went well with the wines. And I found that the chips uh, seemed to go with uh, the several wines that you poured for me. Thank you. Yeah, that is when, yeah, the chips at this point. <laughs> so my whole thing has always been when the food and wine pairing program has to be very fun and important because for me it's always in my mind when I'm drinking I want to eat and when I'm eating I want to drink so if they don't go hand in hand together then you're kind of losing out on a huge component of things so finding the chips that are a uh, different uh, have a unique aspect to them but also do really exemplify just not just the wines but help make the, the wines help make the chips better at the same time is uh, what I've found. And I like your philosophy. You say, uh, we aged it for you. So you are laying them down for a while before you release them. We uh, tasted your 15 Cabernet and your 2011, and the Pinot was uh, 2014. Well, yeah, and there's a huge... There, I mean, there's a lot of things that can be said about that. I We age them for you to a point where I feel very comfortable that they are in an amazing place. But even still, our wines, uh, when we push them out the door and somebody says... How long can I hold on to this? And even the ones that are already 8 and 10 years old, I generally feel most of them have 8 to 10 plus years left in them at the same time. Uh, but I always like it when, or thought it was interesting when I'd go to a tasting room and we would enjoy something and somebody would say to me, well, if you like it now, it's going to be perfect in five years. And I'm like, well, you know what? Uh, only about... 1% of people can hold on to a bottle for five years. It's a very small component of who is actually drinking wine that will sit on it for that length of time. Uh, so I think, I think it's interesting to have a nice array of wines that have already been aged for that t uh, time period and still available for purchase as well. Yeah, and as you say, uh, they, they will hold up for quite a while longer if you choose to hang on to them. And it's fun to introduce people who, because we are downtown Napa, and I love downtown Napa, but we get a, we get a good uh, juxtaposition of very well well knowledge buyers and drinkers and experienced tasters to very new people who are coming in uh, and trying to find something different and experience wine for maybe the first or second time and it's always interesting when we 
when I pour them a 5 to 10 year old Chardonnay or an 8 year old to 10 year old Cabernet and they go wow wines age this is really good I didn't think that things were supposed to get better I thought they were just supposed to be young and fresh and oh those are novice tasters those are very novice people yes so or anything that they've had before that's more than three years old was not meant to age for more than three or four days on the shelf so which yeah there are. yeah and I want to say I really enjoyed your Chardonnay and um, has a little hint of oak on it a little bit of a toasty note not too much at all and uh, you say you barrel ferment your Chardonnay. Yes. So we, um, and I love, again, barrel fermentation uh, adds really fun and different aspects to uh, all different types of wines. And experimenting with it has been really interesting. So, And your Pinot Noir, you mentioned it being kind of like an old world wine. And it does have a good amount of fruit on it. I prefer a uh, fruity Pinot Noir. Had that mid palate fruit, but it does have a lingering earthy finish to it. Thank you. Yeah, th- that Pinot Noir, I always like to think of that there is more of a forest floor aspect to it, uh, as well as kind of a fungal note to it. And in addition to the brighter fruits that come through quite well, um, the acidic fruits, uh, which again make me, I always like to think. <sighs> Duck confit, and I get in a lot of trouble because, as I mentioned, that I like the idea of food and wine so much. And when I'm hosting tastings, and I just keep listing off everything that I want to eat with every wine everybody's pairing, and everybody, I get a lot of uh, people just looking at me going, "When are we having any of these dishes? Stop talking about the dishes unless you're going to bring some out." I'm getting very hungry. So, <laughs> but with duck confit and with uh, with heavier things that a lot of times Pinot Noir is not always considered, I think that this stands up very well to a lot of fat. And you mentioned mushrooms too, and, and mushrooms, yeah. yeah. Um, and you mentioned Cole's Chop House here in town. Mm-hmm have suggested your Pinot Noir to people who are ordering steak. It was. For a while, We uh, that was always kind of fun of that they would be, use our wine as a component to say, if you're not looking for that big Napa Valley Cabernet with your steak, this is uh, a Pinot Noir that can really stand up to a, a ribeye, which is another one of those things that made me excited about those chips. <laughs> so, right, right. Even the Chardonnay. Um, Chardonnay is so versatile with a lot of things and can be steak tartare or carpaccio. Uh, they're light and seared red meats that uh, have some fat and some richness to them. Well, tell me when you're open here at your outdoor parklet and also indoors at Shadow Box Cellars. So, uh, so we are open six days a week, uh, every day but Wednesday. Um, we do suggest appointments. Any of our salt and acid tastings we do inside currently. I host all of them for the most part. Uh, and we are at least this during this time of year. And uh, so those are available by appointment starting at 1030 every day and up until late evening. Um, and then our parklet here outside is available for walk in starting at 11 a.m. until about 7 a.m. Again, every day but Wednesday. No salt and acid tasting outside? They are available, but it is a little bit more of a casual tasting outside. Um, so they're, they're on their own then? It is. It's on their own. You get to experience the chips and, uh, and pair them with the wines kind of on your own. We'll all come in and check. Uh, we'll discuss the wines as we go through everything, but inside is a little bit more of an intimate experience where we'll walk through every single wine and, uh, and also use in, inside we use our Mark Thomas uh, lead-free crystal stemware as well. Well, Justin, thank you so much for sharing your wine and uh, your salt and acid tasting and your uh, fascinating story. It was a pleasure. Thank you so much for coming down and joining me. Absolutely. Cheers. Well, cheers. Thank you so much. For a -a one-of-a-kind wine pairing, try the salt and acid tasting at Shadowbox Cellars the next time you're in downtown Napa and pick up some of their aged wine that's ready to drink. Be sure to check on their tasting availability over the next couple of months. Find the phone number online and his wine at shadowboxsellers.com. I can't wait until we can get back to wine tasting whenever we choose to. Restrictions should ease up in the coming month or two. If you can, please support your favorite wineries by purchasing online. They will greatly appreciate it. We've reached the end of the road for today. Find more interviews at onthewineroad.com and updates on Instagram at JD Wine Road. Stay safe, be patient, and I'll see you soon on The Wine Road. I'm Jeff Davis. Hello. 
Hosting for this podcast is generously provided by Transistor at Transistor.fm.